Hello and a warm welcome to Econoday Unplugged on Tuesday, the 5th of October 2021. Mark Pender is on the US East Coast and I'm Jeremy Hawkins in London. So is the Fed finally ready to trim its quantitative easing programme? Well, September's employment report will probably decide one way or another. So all eyes this week will be on Friday's US non-farm payroll data. Investors seem fairly convinced that the tapered trigger is about to be pulled, but to state the obvious, forecasting employment growth is never easy and all the harder during a pandemic, so there could yet be some significant surprises. Meantime, the ongoing impasse over debt ceiling hardly makes the Fed's job any easier, and neither do further signs of slowing growth in China and continued uncertainty over the fate of Evergrande. Elsewhere, the Eurozone is still battling with overshooting inflation on the one hand, but increasingly serious hits to economic activity from compromised supply chains on the other. And in the UK, creeping stagnation worries are likely to see the government announce a fresh supports package for the labour market in Wednesday's budget. The RBA Monday confirmed that it will be on hold for now and quite probably through February next year. But its antipodean cousin, the RBNZ, the Kiwi Central Bank, is widely seen hiking rates by 25 basis points later today. So to the Fed then, Mark, mm, yes. well, it will take from Friday's labour mm. market update for QE tapering to begin next month. Well, let's see. The low end of Econoday's consensus range has been coming down since uh, since last week. We're at 250,000. So is that a, a, a decent report, as, uh, as Jerome Powell uh, said in his uh, uh, conference, uh, FOMC conference? Uh, it would take uh, nothing more than a decent report for... Um, um, tapering to begin next month at, uh, at the beginning of their meeting next month. Now, what's interesting about this is um, the Federal Reserve has, in fact, uh, cornered it. They've finally fallen into a kind of day's trap, which is a complete focus on immediate economic data. The Fed always steps back and, you know, they want to smooth things out and they want to take a bunch of uh, a, a grouping of economic data, look at it over time. But not this time around. They were such on the edge. And I guess the push by the Hawks was was enough for them to just pinpoint a single report. It's, not, it's going to take something decent. Now, uh, the August report came in below uh, a kind of day's consensus range at 235,000. So presumably that's not a decent number. So at 250,000, which is the low end of consensus, that's not so great. Now there is one little odd little thing here is uh, the, the uh, revisions are possible factor here. It, it's the same indicator, but it's the revision of non-farm payrolls. Let's say July is revised substantially higher or uh, or August is revised substantially higher or lower, that could be a factor too. Uh, that could offset um, uh, the the uh, the significance of the number itself that we get. The consensus right now, Canada's consensus is 475,000. It's been stable there. But like I said, the low end has, um, has been coming down, which is in line with the indications, Jeremy. I mean, we have, you know, uh, uh, jobless claims have not improved over the last month uh, s since the last uh, employment report. They've been uh, uh, steady at the 350,000, moving a little bit higher, uh, roughly about the same area. And then we just had two other indicators this morning. This is Tuesday morning. We had a PMI um, services sector report, which confirmed the mid-month report that uh, employment in this sample is subdued, and that's uh, and they're blaming it on lack of available labor. Uh, we had the ISM employment uh, index, services index, which is uh, used to be incredibly closely watched. Uh, I guess a little less so lately, but maybe. But let's look at it, at it anyway. It came in at fifty three, so that's showing that a slightly more um, uh, companies in the sample increased hiring. Uh, this month than last month, but that's actually a little bit lower than 53.7 in August. So these are key indicators. And then tomorrow we're going to get the ADP report, which will be a big hit here on Akana Day. It, that gets a lot of interest. And whether um, what ADP sees, now they called it right last time, uh, it, the direction uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the decline. Now, whether they get it right next uh, for this month is completely unknown, but anyway, it'll create a lot of interest. And um, so, and, and there is another odd factor. 
and that's hourly earnings. If hourly earnings somehow, shoot, we're only expecting a 0.4 monthly um, increase, which is uh, a firm but down from uh, 0.6, which is elevated in August. But the annual is at 4.6, which is really elevated. But it, if those take off, that could be another factor. That's the inflation thing. So, um, so there's yeah, there's two things. We have a you know an, an employment. Uh, labor market in the U.S. that needs uh, uh, support, and we have inflation that is pointing to the withdrawal, uh, the need to withdraw support. So, it's an interesting, interesting time. But we'll see what happens, uh, you know, on Friday. Let me let me ask you something. Just going back to these payrolls, let's try and look at some of them. And it seems okay. that well, we got quarterly average in then for the first quarter of five hundred eighteen thousand, six hundred fifteen thousand for the second quarter. Mm -hmm. And if I did me back of the envelope calculations right, um, we need an increase in the or in, sorry in the September payroll ignoring any possible revisions of at least 557,000, which from what you're saying, if the market consensus right is right, um, we ain't going to get. Does that mean, I mean, I must say, it does seem that there's a, there's a tendency for the August payroll to be revised up if history is anything to go by, but mm -hmm. not, I suspect, by as much as it would be required to actually get up to this 557 number if, you know, the, the market consensus is going to yeah. be correct. How That's does, right. What do you think? Let's suppose then we get. Let's suppose we don't get any revisions, and let's suppose okay. we get a two hundred thousand payroll. Mm. Wages come in as expected. Mm. What does the FOMC do? Well, Fed stock, Fed talk comes into play. The all the, the voters will be, you know, uh, crowding um, conferences and things, and wanting to talk and wanting to explain to people what the uh, payroll. Although, go on CNBC and. And they'll be telling us what a two hundred thousand really isn't that bad, you know, <laughs> or so the, so they'll have a lot of Fed talk to be doing for to explain to uh, uh, what this number is. And this is kind of un, you know, it, it's not the ground, the, uh, the battleground, the battlefield for the Fed. The battlefield for the Fed is this, you know, ivory tower kind of a distant kind of thing. Now they're in the nitty gritty, the, the you know, knee deep in the <laughs> in the mud. And they're going to be having to pick apart an um, in, in, in individual report. So not only with the headline number, they could say, well, government payrolls were this and that, or leisure and hasp hospitality were this and that, or motor vehicles, if you look at it, excluding. So there'll be all these explanations if we get a number that's on the low side, if we get a 500 number, a 400 number, or even probably a 300 number, we won't have this need you know, we'll all accept that the, 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 that tapering will begin, even though I think there will be Fed speak on a 300 number. But I think something in the four or five range, I mean, slowing uh, recovery in payroll growth, you know, uh, that has to be expected given the, the great, you know, collapse last year and then the immediate re recovery. And so we're, we'll be getting a slower recovery, but it looks like it's going to be a very slow recovery to make up the jobs that were initially lost. OK, let's suppose then we get, I don't know, something like your 400 to 500 payroll and we don't get any significant revisions. So the Fed, when we get to November FMC, then it confirmed that quantitative easing well, hey, is finally about to start. What's it going to look like? So we've got, what, 120 billion worth of purchases yeah. on month at the moment, isn't it? What's going to happen uh, going forward? Well, uh, they were, uh, Powell's talking about a year's time. So what, you know, you divide that by 10 or, or by a, a 12th. And I guess they're going to, I mean, that's a rough idea of how they're going to be shaving these purchases uh, between treasuries and mortgage back. That I, I don't think there'll be a separation on it, uh, between those two groups. But I think it's going to be, you know, $10 billion less supporting the, the bond market every month. Uh, that would, I think, be a reasonable um and you know, interest rates are going to go up. You know, I mean, when, so I suppose that's my next question. So, when do interest rates? Enough of this quantitative easing lock, but when do we actually see you know, official interest rates going up? Well, I think you'll see if you see a four hundred, if you see a five hundred non payroll number on Friday at eight thirty one or eight <laughs> eight thirty zero zero one, you will start seeing a takeoff in U.S. Treasuries. I just think that that would, in, unless there's some tech, technical imbalance with shorts or something like that in the market, I think that the that the um, 
this can't mean anything, but this is just less buyers, significant uh, fewer buyers, and the Federal Reserve is, is stepping back from the bond market. So that just supply and demand would, 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 would suggest that interest rates are bound to go up. Okay, fair enough. Anything else you want to say from the uh, state side? Uh, let's see. I'm just thinking about, you know, inflation really hasn't ebbed much. Uh, and you had a European PPI report that didn't look very good. I mean, even though the monthly came back, it was still over 1% gain for Eurozone PPI. And you had a record, what, 13.4% was it for the year on year? Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, over, over here, um, it's quite interesting. I think you now from everything you're saying, there's kind of this bias on the, the FOMC at the moment that, you know, they really want to start this quantitative easing lot. So unless you get a very soft payroll or whatever it may be in Friday's report, you know, that's what's going to happen. In Europe, it is still very different. Um, I think they've got, you know, two big issues here. One, the fact that inflation is still very much heading in the wrong way. I mean, perhaps, you know, it's topped out on your side of the pond, but in Europe, it's certainly still accelerating. And the pipeline indicators suggest that there's more to come. So as you mentioned, we did have the uh, producer price index for August. That was released earlier on today. Um, we've had, what, four consecutive monthly increases now of above 1%, which is pretty unprecedented. As you also mentioned, we got, I mean, we got, ridiculously high levels now. I mean, the headline PPI uh, compared to a year ago, albeit they've got some COVID effects in there, 13.4%. So we've got this ever widening gap currently between what's happening to consumer price inflation mm -hmm. and to you know, the, the pipeline indicators, which are supposed to suggest where inflation is going to go. Now, even if we strip out energy, which has always has the biggest impact on a lot of these numbers, the PPI was up 7.4% on the year. Now, these are sort of numbers we really just haven't seen before. So bottom line for you know, the ECB is still, well, is inflation peaking? Um, is it still going up or is it about to turn the corner? And although the official line at the ECB continues to be very much that don't panic, it's transitory, it'll all start coming back again next year. I think we've had such a run of these uh, strong input numbers now. Uh, and indeed, if you refer to the PMI at the States, well, we've still got very strong input costs and you need output prices coming out of the Eurozone PPI as well. The investors are beginning to think that you know, this is going to be more than a short-term issue. And the problem, of course, with ECB is the fact that the real economy still isn't really doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, we'll get the retail sales figures for August on Wednesday. Um, if the market's right, the consensus, um, according to Connor Day, is for an increase of 0.8% on the month, which in normal times would be quite respectable. But that would be after 2.3% drop in July. Um, and indeed, even if the consensus is right, it would mean that the, the quarterly average so far um, for the third quarter would only be just, what, 0.6% above the second quarter, which was surprisingly weak. So demand is starting to slow. Industrial production, we know, although it has shown some better signs of late, it's still well below you know, where it should be at this stage of the recovery process. So the ECB really is, is caught between a rock and the proverbial hard place with inflation too high and the economy, if anything, still disappointing. Um, now, it's interesting, uh, in light of what we've seen from the bond markets, where investors do seem to be anticipating you know, higher inflation or at least higher interest rates at some point. Um, look at bond yields currently for, well, for Germany. You know, they're about 10, 12 basis points above now where they were at the time of the March ECB meeting when the, uh, the central bank decided to increase their quantitative easing purchases, the ones they uh, make under the PEP, their pandemic emergency purchase program. So strictly speaking, they should be thinking about raising their, quant their quantitative easing asset purchases. But of course, just a couple of weeks ago, beginning of the month, they d decided to come out and unwind at least some of the increase they introduced in March time. So I've got to say from the weekly figures, it's hard to say exactly what the current monthly buying rate is for QE asset purchases courtesy of the ECB, but they really are sort of struggling, I suspect, at the moment to really work out exactly what they should be doing. Um, all of which I think is certainly being reflective. We look at euro dollar. I mean, certainly it seems that you know, expectations of Fed tapering at the same time as we still got aggressive asset purchase coming out of the ECB and no foreseeable chance of a hike in ECB interest rates over the foreseeable future. It's certainly working to the benefit of the dollar and depressing um, the euro. But the ECB still at the end of the day is going to be unhappy because we talked about on previous podcasts, you know, their goal in life currency are currently 
is uh, maintaining so-called favourable financing conditions. And higher interest rates, pretty well right across the curve, albeit they're still very low, and in all the various Euro <coughs> excuse me, Eurozone countries, um, is not good news for keeping those financing conditions as favourable as the ECB would like. Well, you know, did you see the uh, Reserve Bank of Australia? Part of that announcement was too favourable uh, on the credit availability and housing. Um, so they mentioned rising housing prices, uh, and they have a quarterly report that Conade tracks, and the, the graph has been going pretty much straight up, as it has been in the U.S. And actually, for what, the Halifax and um, what's the other one in the U.K.? The, the nationwide, yeah. The nationwide, all, yeah. And in fact, I think if you want to look at global health prices um, and you're a hawkish central banker, then that's probably your best bet as helping to justify a hike in interest rates. As you mentioned, the RBA is certainly highlighting that, although it seems at this stage they're still reluctant to do anything with policy until we at least get into next year. And they make sure that what is going to be, by the looks of it, a pretty dreadful third quarter for the economy you know, is just temporary and due to all the additional COVID restrictions they int introduced. As they are waning now, you know, they're looking for a sharp back, bounce back in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, I mean, they've already effectively been told by the government that they've got to do something with a housing market boom. Be it, or be it not actually a, you know, a direct responsibility of the central bank. So the housing market is one of those issues, which I think as we talked about in the podcast before, because borrowing costs have simply been so low for so long. Mm. It's led a lot of these prices to go up to artificial levels. You um, know, one thing we haven't been talking about is, um, it's interesting too, is the profit margins. Uh, if uh, Input costs are going sky high, even though these business surveys are talking about pass through to their customers, which aren't always consumers, there are other businesses as well. But yeah, as you were saying, we, we've seen greater price acceleration in producer prices than we have in consumer prices. But how, how long can this go on before it eats into profits? I'm just looking at, um, it wasn't eating into US profits in the second quarter. They were still very, very substantially um, uh, 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 higher. So, uh, in any case, but it's an interesting question why the stock markets haven't been talking about this. And, um, it certainly hasn't affected them. They're at record levels. Yeah. I think it'd be interesting what to wages. I mean, certainly for the UK, the numbers are quite badly distorted because we talked before about you know, the compositional yeah. effects and so on. Um, but if you look at the Eurozone, certainly a better overall picture of Europe, and Eurozone wages are still rising at less than 2% a year. So uh, it does seem that you know the, the big increase you had in unemployment has actually led to you know, workers being prepared to accept at most any small pay rises where they actually get them. Well, know, that's right. We, you know, because these higher producer prices will dampen wage wages, even though there's shortages. So that's an offsetting factor. I mean, what can the companies really afford to pay? Um, so, um, and if the Fed starts pulling back on its stimulus, that can't. That can't be good for the stock market. So, well, it's, yeah, exactly that. And of course, in just uh, going back to the UK, um, at the end of September, we saw the termination of the government's furlough program. I mentioned in the intro that the budget we'll get, which is the big statement from the UK government about what it plans to do with our spending and taxation over the next three years. That, by the looks of it, will see um, an extension of what's known as the Job Entry Targeted Support Scheme, to give it its full title, or JETS, which is aimed at helping those out of work because of COVID-19 who have been out of work for at least three months. Now, that's good news, but by the looks of it, the total cost of this package is only about 500 million sterling. The overall low cost, the big program, which has been instrumental in helping the UK labour market, that's costed cost an estimated about 66 billion sterling so far. So really, this extension to this, this JETS program is really just a drop in the ocean. And one reason why, despite talk now that you might even get the Bank of England hiking interest rates before the end of the year, which personally I still think is very unlikely, and one reason for expecting them not to do that is simply because they do want to see what the impact of pulling the plug on the furlough scheme is going to do to the labour market. Because like all these central banks at the moment, it seems as if the labour market is as important to determining what's happening to policy than pretty well anything else. You know, I have a historical question for you, Jeremy. I was stumbling across things, and uh, it was back in the 70s in the UK, and the discovery of North uh, Sea oil had changed because that was a, not, not not the greatest decade for the UK economy, and but the outlook was so strong. What? How did that all play out over history? 
Well, uh, net, net, I suppose you've got to say badly. Um, if you look at the likes of another you know, big oil producer in Europe, such as Norway, what they have is this fund. So I can't remember precise term, but basically it's an investment fund for the future. So uh, a big chunk of oil revenues um, have been put aside and invested to ensure that you know, future populations can continue to enjoy life you know, as and when uh, the oil runs out. Um, for lots of the UK, although some of it was actually put into investment, a lot of it went into you know, basically just consumption. So a lot of what should have been you know, long term oil wealth was squandered. And although we do still make money out of the North Sea oil, you know, I think you know, the general opinion is uh, you know, too much of it was wasted, not actually put into you know, the kind of projects which would help to ensure the longer term productive capacity and enhance the longer term productive capacity of the UK economy in general. So are the reserves of oil um, finite or are they declining? Oh, very, yeah, very much so. I mean, UK, UK oil production peaked a while ago now. Although having said which, every now and again, they do find a new field. But of course, since everyone is supposed to be going green now, whether mm. or not you're actually allowed to you know, operate the new field, well, you know, that, that remains to be seen. I think if we're in China, such as the state of energy supplies there at the moment, they just told their coal producers, don't worry mm. about both, just do all you can. But yeah. you know, that's the global green framework, allegedly. Yeah, yeah. All uh, the shortages, they're amazing. And China with the energy shortage hitting, that's a, a quite yeah, a surprise. Just, and indeed, just, well, just looking at what the, the PMIs we had out of China what, at the beginning of this week, the official mm -hmm. number was, what, below 50? The, the, sorry, the official one was just below 50, yeah. The market, the independent one, was on 50. And part of that was due to, as they admit themselves, was due to power shortages. So it's, you know, it's, it's, this whole energy issue is going to have a big impact, I think, on what happens to global growth over, over several months to come. Mm -hmm, if, mm -hmm. if I can, while well, since we start on employment, so we'll try and perhaps get close to finish on employment, I should mention it's not just uh, payrolls at the States. Um, which no, we have Canada. States. Right. We do. We do have Canada. <laughs> and what do we got? We got employment there. That's expected to be up um, consensus around about fifty seven and a half thousand. That'd be down from just over ninety thousand. But that'd still be pretty good, right? Which would still be a good number. In fact, just crunching some of the numbers, I reckon that would put a level of employment just 0.5 percent below its pre pandemic level. So basically, you know, the employment gap, the, if, if the market consensus proves accurate, the employment gap will almost be closed. So from that side, it's certainly uh, in line with the Bank of Canada, you know, introducing additional tapering before the end of the year. Um, now, the July GDP figures we have, which were minus 0.1% on, on the month, were disappointing. Um, but um, it looks as if they're calling for about a 0.7% increase in August. And it looks as if now momentum, again, partly due to the COVID restrictions being eased, et cetera, et cetera, is picking up again. And indeed, if you've got an improving real economy and you've got inflation like Canada has at some 4.1%, so well above target, then it would seem that, um, yeah, it could be a race between the Fed and the BOC is to see almost who tapers next. But again, having said which, the um, Bank of Canada's view is still that there won't be an interest rate hike there until we get into the second half of next year. So presumably, potentially after um, what the Federal Reserve is going to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, by the way, the 4.1% is the PCE rate as well to show you the congruence of these two economies. You know. Interesting, yeah. I think it's quite interesting. I mean, yeah, looking over how, how many, a couple of decades now, we've been so used to inflation just being so low, typically below target. And now, you know, the proverbial shoe is in is on the other mm. foot. It's just a question of how long it's going to stay there. It's those kind of things that keep us in business. Keep it is. interested it in is. data. <laughs> I would say long may it continue, but of course, that depends on how you're invested. Okie dokie. Well, I guess that's enough prattling from us for today. So let's wrap it up there then. Um, well, I guess even more than usual, all eyes this week will be on Friday's US labour market data, which, of course, you'll be able to find detailed and analysed in Econoday's global economic calendar, where, incidentally, you can also find coverage of all the other key data and events likely to impact the financial markets. Bar for Mark and myself, thanks as ever for listening. Podcasts will be back again next week. Hope to see you then. Bye for now.